Welcome back to the Eight Man Breakdowns podcast. This is where we discuss all phases of the game of football, including philosophy, play concepts, questions, and more. Joining me today is Coach Kevin Ayers. Coach Ayers is the head coach at Little River High School in Little River, Kansas. Coach Ayers has 26 years total of coaching experience and is heading into his fifth year at Little River. Coach Ayers is a legendary Kansas high school football coach and the fastest coach in Kansas history to reach 100 career wins and reaching 200 last season. He's also the first and only head coach to win a state title at three different schools, two at Jet Moore in 2001 and 2003, one at Sharon Springs in 2007 with a runner-up finish in 2013, and one at Little River in 2020 with runner-up finishes in each of the last two seasons. Well, Coach, thanks for joining me today. Hey, thanks for uh, the opportunity to be on. Uh, it's a privilege. So here, just start a little bit with some background about yourself. So tell us a little about your, your high school playing days and how you got into coaching and if you had any mentors along the way. Well, I played uh, I played eight-man football um, from Tri-Plains High School. Um, they usually compete to be one of the smallest, if not the smallest schools in the state. So uh, uh, the biggest geographical district in the state and one of the smallest schools. And I was very fortunate to play under Coach Brian Rush, um, a big mentor of mine. Um, love the eight man game, love playing there. Uh, and my first playing experience out of high school was at Bethany College. I played there for four years under Coach Kessinger and really enjoyed that, learned a lot. I would say those two coaches, uh, Kessinger and Rush, really shaped uh, just how I went about um, coaching. And so thankful to play for both of those guys. Um, and first job was at Jetmore. Um, Moved from there to Sharon Springs and uh, landed in Little River. Uh, it's kind of funny. Uh, we moved uh, from Jetmore, great community. Uh, really loved it there. My my father passed away and felt we needed to get closer to home, and so moved to Sharon Springs. And then uh, after uh, being there for a long time, helping my mom out, um, I just felt it was time to get close to my wife's parents. And so Little River is where she's from, and so we made the move there. And and I've been very blessed to be in three communities that were extremely supportive and uh, just a joy uh, to coach at, a great place to live and, and, and raise kids. So it's been a, I don't know, the good Lord's had a good journey for me. Obviously seeing that you played eight man at Tri-Plains and you got to play linebacker at Bethany. Talk about the transition from eight man in high school to playing defense. I feel like defense in 11 man is more intricate than obviously than offense can be as far as translating the game eight man to 11 man talk about going from eight man to playing defense in college well I think you know eight man football I guess uh you know in high school I was a linebacker and a, and a safety and you feel like you need to be in on every play um you know you need to and and and, and essentially you kind of do at those two spots in the eight man game um, you know, when you get to 11 man and it's so much more position specific and, uh, just, I, I, the game is slower. It develops slower. I'm not saying the players are slower, obviously not, but, but, but things in 11 man just develop so much slower. Uh, you know, the tailbacks set a lot deeper, um, with all the zone stuff that they do, it just, it just develops slower. And so I would say just that feeling of having to make every play and get to every, you know, every ball, um, and then you get into the 11 minutes, it's, it's a lot more about taking care of your exact job, um, not getting out of position, um, you know, and, and of course, being at the collegiate level, the, the reads were elevated and uh, schemes were elevated just because of, you know, all you did is play defense now and you didn't have to play offense and special teams and all those things you did uh, when you were, you know, in high school. So it's, it's still, you know, it's still run and tackle, but, uh, I really do feel it, it develops a little bit slower. Oh, absolutely. The speed of the game is very fast. And I went to the offensive side when I played Juco and I didn't know nothing. So would you say you had to learn a lot on the fly or was it kind of easy to learn the defense being more position specific like that? You know, it was, it, it was a little bit tough and, and now looking back, I'm thankful for this. When I first got to uh, Bethany, I was playing corner. Um, and so I got to experience all the DB drills, all the coverages. And and uh, obviously with more DBs, coverages are, are uh, you know, there, there's just a lot more things you can do and uh, a lot more coverages. And so at first it, it did blow my mind a little bit. 
Um, and I got moved to safety and, and, and experienced that and then got moved to outside linebacker and actually got moved to middle linebacker for a while. And, and, uh, it's just I'm just always thankful now that I played all those positions because I think as a coach, um, I came away with a, a lot of knowledge um, at each of those positions, which have helped me, you know, uh, help my players. Um, so it's a uh, it's it's funny at the time I didn't I didn't think it was so cool to move all around, but now it's it's been a good thing. Yeah, I'm sure it was a lot to learn and a lot of changing quickly. So what kind of defense did you guys run then? We were four three. Has that influenced your eight-man defense at all? I mean, obviously the knowledge for sure, but like as far as the four-three translating into eight-man, um, not not so much, you know, as the full scheme, but as individual technique, you know, definitely some of the things we do with our reads and our steps, and and uh, some of the things we do with our coverages, you know, I've I've taken from that. Uh, so it has obviously the D line play is, is much different, um, than what you're asking those guys to do at least at, in at Bethany in their four-three. But, uh, yeah, there's some things you take, and most of it's just in the indie, you know, individual, uh, just footwork and, and positioning and, and, and things like that. Coach, as we know, football is a copycat game. It always has been, but we all take things from each other and make it our own. What would you say is something that kind of separates your program from others? You know, I don't know if it's different than everybody else, but, you know, we're a program that just really strives to take care of each other, build each other up. Um, I think, uh, in today's age with, with just everything going on in kids' lives, having a place to go after school where you're wanted, um, where you're loved, where you've got guys that are, that are lifting you up, building you up, um, feels good. And as a coach, it's very rewarding to watch teams, um, start to come together. And, and even more so we got, you know, one of our brothers is hurt and going through something tough. And watching the guys rally around them, and and uh, which just extends beyond football. Um, I hope uh, you know we're, we're a program that's making these boys better at life. Um, you know, and you hear this a lot, but I truly believe that that football is a good avenue to teach young men to be better. You know, better students, better kids. You know, a better son, a better father, a better dad. Just there's just so many things that come from. Um, from football, I know, I know it's impacted my life. That's why I got into coaching is, is just the impact that my coaches had on me. And, uh, you know, hopefully our program is one that's, that's doing that same thing, producing just a better man. And, um, so I don't know if it separates us, but it's something we really, really focus on. Yeah, absolutely. Developing better men through the game of football. There's nothing better. I know I'll say this from an outsider looking in on you guys' program. I would say something else you guys do kind of differently, like you talked at the at the clinic about your summer leadership stuff that you guys take that trip to Lake Wilson. Right. But then, like you said, building each other up. And one other thing I would say that's kind of rare would be to see a veteran coach like yourself doing the feed the cats. I don't think that's a very common thing, you know. And maybe it is more common now, but I think mm -hmm. for veteran coaches to to rewire into less conditioning and less grind is better. But yeah, I don't know many veteran coaches using the Feed the Cats program. Feed the Cats flies in the face of what a traditional football coach is. And uh, I, I'll be the first to admit I, I struggled and still do struggle a little bit sometimes with going from what I was, what our program was, as far as, as uh, you know, what we do conditioning wise, what we do to toughen our teams up, what we do to make sure we're the manliest men on the field to a feed the cat style, which, you know, we now we're making sure we're the freshest. Um, we're making sure we're the most excited. Um, we're making sure we're the most recovered. We've had the most rest. And, uh, you know, we, we've, we've had success both ways. I don't, you know, I think my former players would, if they would come to a practice, um, and watch what we do now, uh, compared to what I used to put the boys at Jetmore through the boys at Sharon Springs through their jaws would drop. Um, and, and, and part of me wants to apologize because I think I took, I took some of the joy and the fun out of football by trying to make, you know, our teams, the physically toughest, baddest, mentally toughest, baddest, you know, players on the planet. And to their credit, they handled it. And I really feel they were some of the toughest, baddest, you know, teams on the planet. But, 
uh, that's that's the hard way of doing things and and uh i just really feel um i i stole some of the joy and some of the fun and had we been a feed the cats program back then i think we still would have had the success and uh but i still i i also think that some of my players would argue former players would argue but but coach i'm so much more mentally tough physically tough just better better able to handle life because of what you know what I went through in, in football. And so, you know, that's the, that's the inner war I go back and forth with inside myself is, yeah, we want to be feed the cats, but we also do some still some really physically hard things and some mentally hard things to, uh, to keep our players, I guess, you know, knowing and thinking that if they are thrown a physically or mentally hard situation, they can still handle it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to spend all the time on, on feed the cats, but I do have a, a thought on your previous coaching style and I know a lot of the veteran coaches are, are similar to that is that something that just you think came from how you were coached is that something you got from how you were coached and how you brought up through college and all that or is that something where where do you think that came from I guess well it was a little bit I mean definitely a little bit of high school um you know coach rush we, we would line up we're going to run 40 40s today um and mentally that was a huge challenge physically that's a huge challenge they were timed and you know you only get so much rest and and so from a mental and physical standpoint you were just straight up grinding and you know i think i think it did make me a little mentally tougher and physically tougher uh so so there's a there's a component to that um but i also think as you get you know to the end of a season and uh you know because i've put my teams through that and much worse you get to the end of the season and and you're just so mentally and physically beat up um, from the grind that you're not playing your best football. So there's a little bit of a balancing act there, but it's, you know, college was, was a grind at times, but not nearly as much as, as uh, in a high school. And, and mostly because we were required to play, you know, offense, defense, special teams, carry the water out. Just, I mean, with only, you know, a limited number of guys on the team, uh, we did have to be in good physical shape. I would say the feed the cats like last year is the first and only year that I've never been a head coach prior to last year. So it was the first time I ever got to fully implement it in my own way. And I thought we didn't have hardly any injuries. We didn't have anybody get hurt till the till week eight. We had a kid break his leg because he got awkwardly caught up in with a block from behind. So, but other than that, I mean, I thought feed the cats was great for our guys staying fresh and and we were fresh the whole year. It seemed like. I was worried. We had no soft tissue injuries, you know, as far as pulled hamstrings or anything that, mm -hmm. and, uh, our, our cramping issues went way down. And that's something I thought, you know, we're not going to be in shape. We're not going to be, you know, we're not doing all this running. And, and that's where, you know, the feed, the cats, you know, people think it's easy. It's not easy. It's just when we go, we go and we are all out, but then we are going to rest. We're not going to, you know, give you 10 seconds till you're back up on the line. We're going to treat it like a football game where it's all out. And then you get, you know, 25, 30 seconds of rest. And so, uh, you know, those issues went down. I mean, we obviously had injuries late in the year with a broken foot and, uh, and an MCL and, a, and, uh, and an ankle, but those are, you know, those are injuries that would happen with, you know, you can't, you know, the game of football, you mm -hmm. can't, uh, prevent all all of those kinds of things when you get piled up on but um yeah our, our injury rates down i really feel like our cramping issue is is much better so those are some really good things that come from feed the cats yeah and like you said it is it's full on intense as fast as you can go with that rest time right after so going off the feed the cats into the weights program i did have a question here so you've been successful at each school and you talked about your weights program and obviously you teach weights could you talk about how you've reached that commitment in the weight room at each school? Number one, the communities I went into were were very hungry to to be successful, and um, not that there weren't growing pains, but uh, as the kids, you know, as as you see success and you can point back to what we're doing in in the weight room and in strength and conditioning classes and and the difference it's making. Um, you know, when the kids see that, they buy in. And uh, the, the buy-in, I think, I've always said building a program is much easier than sustaining it. Um, just because everybody's excited, they're on board, and uh, they see what's happening. They see the changes in the kids' body, see the changes in performance. 
And and once you get that built, now it's a matter of okay, we got to keep, we got to keep rowing the boat. And uh, something I think you know maybe we do a little bit differently than a lot of teams is is uh, we, we make it fun. Our warm ups. I mean, you you came and watched. Uh, we'll warm up with with a game of dodgeball just to get smiles on their faces, get them awake and uh and make it fun we do some challenges in the weight room at times that that the kids really look forward to and make it a place they want to be i mean i try to make the weight room um a place where there's a lot of excitement and a lot of energy and you know when you've got all your kids around a freshman who's trying to you know set a pr and whatever lift it is it could be max pull-ups it doesn't matter and he's got all his buddies cheering for him that feels good that kid wants to come back because he's He's, uh, he's experienced what it's like to have all of his teammates, you know, wanting the best for him. So, you know, after you get it built, it's, it becomes a, a culture's overused word, but it becomes a culture thing, an environmental thing where it's a place kids want to be. Because getting up, you know, especially in the summers, getting up at, at 5.15 to be at a 6 a.m. weight thing is, you know, it's not, it's not easy. And, uh, and, and the Feed the Cats is filtered into that, too. We used to be a four-day-a-week, you know, we're going to grind after weights and do things like that. So I think, you know, the Feed the Cats system is something kids want to be a part of and makes it a little easier. It's an easier sell. I'm not saying you can't sell it the other way because I've done that, but but it's an easier sell. And, and uh, so that environment, that culture, and suddenly your kids are holding each other accountable, um, which – once that starts to happen, um, your, your, your coaching job gets a lot easier. And so that, that leadership component is huge. I liked a lot of things, obviously, you said there and, and making it fun for him. I actually stole that from you. We've played dodgeball a couple of times now. <laughs> and the, kid, the kids love it. The, the middle school kids really love yeah. it. Those guys, I mean, yeah, those guys are, are mad. Even though it's seven thirty, eight o'clock in the morning, they're mad to stop playing. We yeah. go, Come on, coach. And then, but then I was. Your weights goes back into the Feed the Cats again where Rank Record published. I know you do that because I saw your wall and you've got all your all the different things right. that you test in. And we're the same. But this the middle schoolers this year, I've, this summer, I've been having them max and push-ups, pull-ups, you know, a plank. Or like hanging from a bar. We started doing right. that after you said that too. But we've done the broad jumps, vertical jumps, and the max speed. And, but that's something that once the kids do, like you said, once they see their number of miles per hour or their time or whatever, and they can put that in actual visual of see, okay, I've, I'm improving. Then that gets them that much more excited to keep showing up. And, and we've had really good numbers this summer compared to compared to last year by far. Yeah, but great. Now I'm actually going to talk a little bit uh, about football itself. So I know you spoke at the, at the clinic in April there, um, and you talked a little bit about your two-quarterback system. My question here, could you kind of talk about, like, how you go about game planning the use of two different quarterbacks, it's like throughout the game, how do you know which quarterback's going to be out there or what, what they're going to be doing? Right. Um, two quarterback system for me came about way back in at Sharon Springs. And we just were, we had a couple of kids that, that um, within our schemes were like, well, we really need him at quarterback. If we're doing, if we're doing this and if we're doing that, I'd really like to have that other kid. And I was like, well, why don't we do it? And so um, that's where it started. And I fell in love with it because I can move the pieces of my puzzle now. I can take a kid who's maybe my best quarterback, but he might also be my best receiver and uh, and start moving him around. And uh, each year it's a little bit different. Um, you know, um, last year, uh, Ryland Conan's our under center quarterback. He, he runs veer really well, reads it really well. Um, he throws the ball the best. And then uh, Braxton Lafferty is our other quarterback, and we put him in the gun. And, uh, you know, we can run some quarterback power game. He still throws it well enough to do the play action. And so, you know, it just it just allows you, I think, to put the kids in the best place possible, uh, you know, to be successful. And I think on the other side of that, it, it makes, you know, opposing coaches prepare for, I wouldn't say just two completely different offenses but two very different offenses um with those two styles of play um and you can go years back you know with, with Jaden garrison and and uh and graham stevens who who you know graham was a fullback playing playing back and so uh, when we'd run you know read option in the in the backfield we wanted him up the middle and Jaden get to the edge if we were running beer 
we wanted Jaden to the edge, so he was under, and Graham was a fullback. So it just just uh, allows you to move them all the way, you know, around, and and uh, it makes it really fun to call plays. I just I really enjoy you know a Saturday sitting down where I can move these guys against the team we're playing that week, and uh, you know that, that that chess match that happens between coaches. It just it made it fun for me, and I think it makes it fun for the kids putting them in a position they can be successful, especially if they are that type of athlete that can be successful at multiple positions. So, And you kind of answered my second question here, but you sometimes you do have them both on the field where one goes to receive. They're, they're, you know, it, it just depends on it depends on the year and, and depends on the kids we have. Most of the time they're both on the field. Mm -hmm. um, you're just moving that other kid, you know, um, to a wide receiver spot. and uh, Or, you know, you're running a true empty um, – and so you want your best runner back there that can throw the ball a little bit. And that other kid may be a great wide receiver or we've had him play tight end. A lot of time he moves to the, to the back position. It just, it depends on the year. Our schemes really don't change um, a whole lot as far as schematically what we're running, but where we plug those guys in, you know, changes as those guys, you know, just try to, what, what's their skill set? What do they bring to the table? And, uh, and, and we just, them accordingly have you ever had two quarterbacks in the backfield like with the option of one to hand off to the other and and that guy could still throw it too or is that where either one can take the snap is that what you're saying yeah so kind of mm -hmm. each other and either one can take the snap i have not done that i have played against coaches who have done that um and that creates a little bit of a of an issue there's some talk this year that we might you know it's something we're thinking about because just of the the variability it gives us um, I think it could be easily done. I mean, it's a little bit of a footwork issue. You're going to have to talk about where you're going to stand and, and, you know, the play selection. Typically, our, our quarterbacks own formations and or own plays. And so we, we know if we call a, an underneath veer, this kid's a quarterback. If we call an in-gun read, this kid's a quarterback. But you could definitely put them back there and stand them beside each other and, and snap it to either one, no doubt. So, Coach, now just tell us a little bit about last year. What would you say you learned the most about your team? And just talk a little bit about last season. Well, um, last year we lost in the state championship uh, versus a very good Wichita County team. Um, I would say we were, were a resilient team that improved tremendously, especially as the season progressed. A very unselfish team. Due to injuries, we we got banged up at the end with a, with a broken foot and a and an MCL and and, uh, and an ankle and and so I had to move my best wide receiver Braden Young to it to a guard position in certain sets just to get the best athletes on the field and and just watching those guys I mean so unselfish knowing you're not at a guard you're not going to touch the ball um, you're in doing the dirty work but he was more than willing to do it jumped in embraced it um, and watching the guys rally around each other as we're plugging in, we're plugging in some really younger, you know, inexperienced kids um, in state championship games, in, in the biggest games. And, and they're struggling, but the kids are still rallying around them. Um, that was special. That was special. And, uh, and it didn't turn out the way we wanted, but watching them battle, and we're obviously a little bit, you know, hamstrung because we, we lost our leading tackler and, and, uh, and guard. And, and then it just, it's one of those things where, where uh, I couldn't have been more proud of our team because th there was no quit, there was no give up, there was no finger pointing, uh, no blame game. It's just, you know, this is, is what it is and we're going to give it everything we had. And, and I walked off that field obviously hurting because nobody wants to get beat in a state championship game, but also super proud of my kids and, and, and what they accomplished. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I've experienced that personally actually too where uh... – you got young guys stepping up, you know, in the postseason, and I don't want to go into too much detail. But my our senior year, we went to to state, and we had eight seniors on the team, and four of us, including me, I broke my leg in the semis, were out for that state championship against Thunder Ridge. But but like you're saying, it's not, it's definitely not necessarily a good thing for the seniors or or for the or even for you as the coach at the time, obviously. But it it might be a great thing for the future, you know, because after. Oh. Because those young guys that got the experience when, when we lost, we got our butts kicked that day, but they took us all the way through the playoffs, you know, and they got us to the state game and, and then BNB won two in a row back to back after, you know, after I graduated. So, but, yeah. but yeah, so that's a great thing for the future. It, it really is. And, and valuable experience and, and, uh, 
you know, I, I think it, it instills a little bit of a hunger. Um, there's a, it's hard on you as a coach getting beat in that game is, I mean, it flat takes it out of you, but there's things you learn about yourself. There's things you learn about your kids. There's always positives to take away. And uh, that's something we try to focus on and, and uh, move forward. Yeah. And you guys are going to be kind of young, but obviously that, that experience will help going into this season. So then, so we're talking about that and we're talking about the future. So let's go. That'll take us right into the next one here. So building off last year, what what do you look forward to the most going into this upcoming season? Well, building a young team. I mean, two two seniors, four juniors. Um, we're going to be real heavily dependent on some some sophomores and freshmen stepping into roles, and but that's fun as a coach. I mean, I I, I think that you know how how far can we progress this really young team? You know, from the beginning of the season, which is obviously there's going to be a lot of growing pains. And uh, it's going to take us a time, some time to get, you know, what, what's our offense really going to look like? Where's everybody, you know, where do they fit? And uh, that's something that, you know, we, we have a really good idea or we think we do going into the season. But I guarantee and I've told my kids this, we're going to get some of it wrong because, uh, you know, kids are going to step up to the plate. They're going to they're going to show us things that we didn't know they could do. And, and uh, so watching this young team grow uh it's going to be really exciting. It's going to be rough at the beginning, and there's, there, we're going to take some lumps. But um, I think by the end of the year, uh, just knowing my boys and knowing these kids, um, they're going to come a long, long ways. Do you guys do any specific team goals, or do you have something like that where you you ask them what their team goals are? And we don't. Um, I uh, even talking with Shane Cordell, um, a mentor of mine. Um, who used to coach at Little River, um, a lot of success back in the day. Uh, you know, you, you can set yourself up. You set these big lofty goals and because uh, you want to be lofty. And we would set big goals. And then, you know, as you go through and you don't hit that goal and you don't hit that goal, um, you know, it can it can become a thing that, that uh, pulls away from all the positive things you're doing. Um, and so... We, we do talk about our, our goal is to be better each day. Um, and we have never talked about even in the last three years when we knew we had, you know, maybe the potential to get to a state championship game if we were lucky. It's not something we talk about. We just talk about today. We're going to get we're going to get better today and we're going to put a better team on the field uh, today than we did yesterday. And so and I think just really focusing on the drill you're in for that day, the practice that day, be in the moment and not so worried about, you know, what's happening in the future has made our kids, uh, the improvement that we see throughout the year, I think is in part to that. It comes back to the feed the cats, you know, you're treating practice and everything you do, you're treating it as a performance, you know, like I'm going to do the best I can with what I'm doing right now. And that's going to help me on Friday nights. And so then here, let's go to this last question then. Yeah, final question here, Coach. So just tell us, what's your biggest piece of advice to any football coaches out there or, or, or upcoming football coaches out there, biggest piece of advice? Well, I think, you know, you, you got to be honest, it isn't always easy, it isn't always fun, um, but the reward of making a difference in a young man's life is worth it. At, at the true core of coaching, it's all about relationships. And as a young coach, I didn't realize that. It was all about how tough – how physical, how fast, you know, how many games can we win? Um, you know, that was the focal point. And, and the older you get, you realize it's all about relationships um, and taking the time to, you know, get to know your kids, invest in their lives. Um, that That's where the magic happens. And that that's the lasting effect. Uh, you know, people aren't going to remember, you know, how, how much you bench, but they're going to remember how you treated people. They're going to remember, you know, the way you walked the halls, the way you interacted. And, uh, and especially young coaches, you are so needed right now. And uh, these young guys need to see men that do it the right way, that go about their business the right way. And so, uh, like I said, I go back to my coaches and the huge impact they had on me. We have such a platform. I don't know of any better platform right now uh, to make a difference in, in kids' lives and being a football coach. 
and so um, it's going to be hard. There, there's there's a lot of things that are uh, you know dealing with dealing with parents, dealing with uh, you know the things that happen in school, the discipline issues, and all that. It's it's not it's not that fun, but man, those are great opportunities for growth. Yeah, absolutely. Relationships, like you said, coach. And then, I mean, something you've already said in there, talking about like just making it fun for these kids, and and like you said, they're, they're going to remember all of that stuff and how you made them feel more than any of these other stats, you know, yeah. and all that stuff. I'll say one thing too. I, I and I think I said this at the at the clinic, but but yeah, that's the one cool thing I like about running this spread multiple offense that we do is our kids had so much fun. I mean, in the, in, in the no huddle type stuff. And right. they're always coming up with, to me with ideas of like, coach, we should, you know, we should do this or we should do, you know, or whatever, or, or here's, I got a signal for this or we should call it, you know, it's like, yeah. it, it just, they just enjoy it. They love being out there. It was something completely new to what they were used to, you know, but, but they love it. And like you said, the, the impact your coaches made on you, obviously the coaches I had did the same and I wanted to reciprocate that to, to my guys. And, but yeah, if I can make it fun for them. Absolutely. It was something and, else. And fun, just because it's fun doesn't mean it's easy. Yeah. It doesn't mean you're joking around. doesn't mean you're not getting a lot out of practice. We, we have a saying, we try to make work fun. Let's find a, make, find a way to make this work fun. And uh, when it's fun, they're giving you their all. I mean, that's, that's just the way it is. And they're enjoying it, and they want to come back, and they look forward to practice. Um, and so it's just a, it's just a shift in, in your mindset. And I, to this day, struggle with it at times because I, I didn't you know I haven't always been this way and uh sometimes I wonder it feels soft at times it feels a little bit soft and the last thing I want my teams to be is soft but I think you know we're still playing a physical style of football just doing it a little different way well coach thanks again for doing this glad you were able to take the time to do this with yeah, me I really appreciate it absolutely I, I sure enjoy it. it's always fun talking ball and and I appreciate you putting all this together I truly love doing it, Coach. So, so yeah, thanks again. And that's going to do it for this episode of the 8-Man Breakdowns podcast. If you ever have a question for me, feel free to comment down below on this video or visit my bio to shoot me an email. If you've learned anything or enjoy any of these videos, please click subscribe and check out some of my other videos right here. And as always, guys, thanks for tuning in.